dangerous things in our everyday lives. We drive, we work, we play. Sometimes people get hurt badly. And when they do, many are driven by ambulance or flown by helicopter to St. Alphonsus Regional Medical Center in Boise, the only level two trauma center in Southwest Idaho. But what does level two mean? And why is that important for those of us who live here? St. Al's trauma surgeon and trauma medical director, Dr. Bill Morgan gives his perspective. Plus, stop the bleed, a kind of first aid training you may not have heard about. It could save a life when you're far from medical help and every second counts. The very straightforward meaning of Stop the Bleed training. Ahead on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. And welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. When you get hurt badly, you go to the emergency room. But not all emergency rooms are the same in the level of care they can provide to trauma patients. Some have trauma center status, and there are several levels of those. St. Alphonsus Regional Medical Center in Boise is the only level two trauma center in southwest Idaho. We're here to explain what that means, what kind of care it can provide, and what why it's important for patients is St. Alphonsus Regional Medical Center trauma surgeon and trauma medical director, Dr. Bill Morgan. Dr. Morgan, thanks for being here today. Glad to be here, Doug. Well, so let's start off just with the basics here. What does it mean to be a level two trauma center? <clears throat> um, the levels of trauma center have sort of evolved over a period of time. A level one trauma center would be a major university trauma center that has residents and has research and does things like that. A level two trauma center would be the next level we function as a level one trauma center, but we don't have any residents and we don't do any research. So other than the fact that we don't have those two things, we're- You're not attached to a hospital we're not or a university. I mean. Correct. So a level two trauma center has, uh, the trauma surgeons are there. We do our own critical care. Uh, we have our own orthopedic surgeons. We have our own neurosurgeons. We have our own uh, ENT surgeons. As a matter of fact, in Boise, we're the only trauma center of our level in the state of Idaho. There are some other level twos, but they don't have some of the things, some of the pieces that we put in place here. And in addition to that, the highest level of care closest to us is 350 miles in either direction. So we kind of are the only game around for Southwestern Idaho. And so how long has St. Al's had that status? <clears throat> we got our designation back in 2010 and that was with the American College of Surgeons. We've been re-verified again in 13 and 16, and we're coming up for re-verification in August of next year. So what kind of cases does this mean that you can handle um, as a level two <coughs> trauma center and, and you know, the types of injuries you'll right. see? We can take care of everything but burns. We do some minor burns, but everything but burns we can handle here. So that could be traumatic car accidents, skiing accidents, industrial accidents. Correct. Car wrecks, falls, um, motorcycle crashes, snowmobiles, ski, ski accidents, snowmore, snowboards, all the above. So um, how is a level two trauma center different than um, a typical emergency room? Well, I guess the best way to explain it is, is in about 1960, when a lot of the guys came back from Vietnam, they realized that the level of care that they were able to provide for our servicemen in Vietnam at some of these remote hospitals was better than the care than citizens in the United States were getting at the major hospitals in the so, United so States. So picture a mass unit, like, okay. Correct. So what, when they came back, they, they came up with the premise that Patients that are injured are best taken care of at a hospital that does that on a routine basis. And so they develop trauma centers. And out of that, trauma centers have specific criteria that they have to meet in order to be verified by the American College of Surgeons. So if you want to be a trauma center, you have to have a surgeon that's available within 15 minutes of the time the patient arrives in the emergency room. Uh, you have to have a critical care unit that can manage those. You have to have neurosurgical coverage. You have to have orthopedic coverage. And while there are hospitals who have those people, they don't have time limitations. In other words, I have to have an orthopedist within 30 minutes in the emergency room of a bad case that needs an, a bone doctor. So it's, it's a commitment on the part of the hospital 
to go above and beyond what a normal hospital would need to manage everyday routine things that they might see. You know, so often uh, you mentioned that uh, St. Alphonsus is the only one within 350 miles in, in any direction that provides that level of care. So many times when we're reporting on stories about bad car wrecks that could be happening you know, in Oregon, sometimes in northern Nevada even, right. um, and of course throughout different parts of this southwest region, you know, often the story is that person was life flighted or airlifted by another um, uh, like a flight service, helicopter flight service to St. Alphonsus in Boise. Right. Um, so do you have, is it partnerships with other hospitals or agreements with them or and, and through the Life Flight Network and the other air ambulances to bring those here? Or is it kind of an understood thing that St. Al's provides that level of care and that's where these folks, these badly injured people need to go? I think it's a little of both. Uh, we do have some what we call transfer agreements with outside facilities and that is something that the American College of Surgeons feels is important because it should be incumbent upon the trauma center to be available to manage whatever patient comes through the door. And so we need to go out there to the community and say, we'd like to have a transfer agreement with you so that if you have a seriously injured patient you can't manage, we'd be more than happy to take them. And it's, it does away with all the red tape. It makes transfer of that patient much quicker. And, um, and puts the patient first. Puts the patient first. And then the other, the other piece to it is we have a, uh, we have a transfer center at St. Alphonsus and it's a one call and we do what's called an automatic accept. So basically you call and you say, I have a trauma patient and they say, send them. Okay. That, that, that's the end of the discussion. You don't have to go find six doctors to say, it's okay, I'll take it. We've already, we already know we're gonna get the patient. So let's bring them on, let's get, you know, Let's get on with taking care of the patient. And we have some pictures of you doing what you do as a trauma surgeon. Is there, I asked you about the difference between a trauma center and an emergency room. Is there a difference between a trauma surgeon and an ER doctor? Yes, there is. Um, I, was a gen I did a general surgery residency, and then I did a fellowship in trauma after that. Um, ER physicians do an ER residency, and they may do uh, maybe a month on a surgical service, but they're not surgeons their emergency room physicians. And so um, I get asked that question on a routine basis. Oh, you work in the emergency room? And it's like, yes, I do work in the emergency room, but no, I'm not an emergency physician. I'm a trauma surgeon that goes to the emergency room. We admit the patient. We do the surgery on them. We carry them through the ICU. We watch them on the floor and we follow them up. So it's a soup to nuts kind of thing. Okay. And so is, is it also a case where you, they know that a severe trauma case is coming in and so you're called and yeah. so you can be there within the 15 minutes. We have, we have three priorities of trauma. Uh, priority three would be someone who's in a minor car wreck uh, or has a fall and but they're otherwise their vital signs are stable. Uh, blood pressure is okay, heart rate's not high. And so that patient would be seen by an emergency room physician and if he deems it necessary for the trauma surgeon to, to come then he would call us and we would come down and it's usually to admit the patient. The level twos, we, when we get a transfer from an outside facility, we label that as a level two because we think there needs to be a little higher index of suspicion that there may be a reason they transferred the patient. So we need to make sure we see them quicker. And the ER docs see those too. And then the priority ones, we, we have uh, made a commitment to be in the emergency room usually before the priority one shows up because we sleep in the hospital but at least within 15 minutes of the time they arrive. So you're there when, there. You're, when you're on call or on shift, Correct. you're there. Right. Um, why would it be, why is it important for the people of this area to have this level of a trauma center here? Well, first of all, this is the largest area of population base in the state. And because of that, we're growing, I think about 8% a year. We're gonna see more and more folks that are gonna enjoy what we do in Idaho, which is, you know, ride our motorcycles and drive our cars and ride bikes and go hunting, hunting and all those things. And so people get hurt. And when they get hurt, they need, you know, the kind of care that we provide. Well, speaking of people getting hurt, particularly in the back country, you have the um, 13th annual ski and trauma conference coming up right. November 1st through the third, third, excuse me, in Sun Valley. Right. Um, what is that all about? <clears throat> about um, 2005, there was a um, young lady who was injured 
on the mountain up at Sun Valley. And she had a cervical spine fracture. And one of the orthopedic surgeons who works here in Boise and has a place up there knows her and he actually helped facilitate getting her transferred down here to Boise. And she got operated on and so because of that fact he came back to some of his friends in Sun Valley and said, you know, I noticed that there was kind of a deficit in knowledge of some of the first responders, the ski patrolmen and folks like that. Maybe we should put together a conference where we can sort of help them fill in some of these, these mm -hmm. holes and perceived deficits. So the next year they had a conference and I think there were 30 people and he actually paid for the conference himself. Okay. And then the following year was the first year I was there. That was in 2007 and I'd only been there about two weeks at that time when I went to the conference and there were maybe a hundred people. It's mostly ski patrolmen, first responders, EMTs, paramedics, um, some nurses, few physicians. But last year we had over 550 people and they were from all over the Pacific Northwest and a lot of agencies. We've had some people from Scotland, we've had some folks from the United Kingdom that have come and lectured. And, and basically it's a chance for these guys to actually get some education that they wouldn't get otherwise and to hear from the experts in the field on if you're out there and you're managing a patient, here's what you need to do. Um, and so it, it's a unique conference because it gives these folks some education they would not get elsewhere. I understand it might even be over 600 this year. That's my understanding. It's, it's, it's up there it's close. It's getting bigger and bigger. It's, uh, that shows the importance of, of, I guess we'd call it you know, backcountry medicine. I mean, when people are that right. far away from a traditional facility to get it, the, right. the, every second, every possible technique right. is, is needed, correct? Because you're talking about a wide range of different types of people who would be trained. Exactly. There, um, <clears throat> one of the first trauma centers in the United States was at the University of Maryland, and they call it shock trauma in Baltimore. And the guy who started it was a guy named Dr. Cowley. And Dr. Cowley used to say that there's the golden hour of trauma from the time the patient is injured till the time they receive care. If you can get them in that golden hour, you have a better chance of, say, getting them to survive. In Idaho, I kid and say, we have the golden day of trauma mm. because frequently it takes that long to get someone out of the back country where they've been injured to definitive care. Wow. So it's, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that the guys out there doing the work in the field that are meeting these patients at the scene are capable of managing certain things that you might not ask of a paramedic in downtown Miami because he's only five minutes away from the trauma sure. center. So it's, it's just a different mentality out here. I mean, you know, folks are doing things that are, that are dangerous, that they like to do, but we need to be able to provide care for them. And so educating our paramedics, our first responders, especially our ski patrolmen in the wintertime, it, it's the right thing to do. And that time of year is coming up now. Right, St. Alphonsus has made a big commitment to these folks. Um, we've, you know, and, and we've gotten a lot of good feedback from them that they really enjoy the conference. But the biggest part is they, they learn something and they use it on a daily basis. Dr. Morgan, thank you so much You're for welcome. your time. I really, really appreciate you coming in today. All right. Interesting stuff. And thank you. I learned a little bit. Stay right there for a second. And meanwhile, St. <coughs> Al's is prepping medical pros for the trauma cases in the backcountry, but serious injuries can happen right in your own home. And you may not be able to just wait for the ambulance to get there. Even if you're squeamish around blood, this is a type of training you might want to hear about. Don't worry, we won't gross you out. But next on Viewpoint, we will tell you how St. Al's is working to stop the bleed. I mean, I could go on and on. Katie's test scores are amazing. They're off the charts. I've never seen anything like it. I know she's only seven years old, but I think we need to move her up to the fourth grade. I'm just so glad we... This. Finally get a chance to talk about it is what can happen if you buy the wrong mattress. Mr. and Mrs. Johnson? So, buy the right mattress. Your daughter's brilliant. Denver Mattress, the easiest way to get the right mattress. I love Mexico! So welcome to another season of Friday Night Football. A nice little scenic view from Sky 7. The other side of the field, and I'll well, give him six points eventually for all this effort. <laughs> Nice push by the big fella. They brought the thunder with them tonight. Oh, no. woo, woo. More Friday Night Football highlights. Have you eagle, what do you think?
Hey, you want to donate that extra bike you have sitting in your garage? Well, this makes it easy. Just bring your unneeded bicycles to any primary health urgent care clinic on Saturday, September 29th between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. They're going to hand them over to the Boise Bicycle Project to be refurbished and distributed to those in need. They'll take bikes of any type, size, and condition. There's 17 primary health clinics in the Treasure Valley. Go online to find the location near you. To post your local event, visit the Idaho Events Calendar at KTVB.com. Kelly Clarkson, Jennifer Hudson, two of the best singers the world has ever seen. And I'm a good singer, but I'm definitely better than Blake. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here to compete. Like, what you going for? This still doesn't seem real. It will when you put this on. I want to be on your team. I want to be on your team, too, though. For God's sakes, this is not a slumber party. It's The Voice. <laughs> the Voice premieres Monday and Tuesday on NBC. And welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Doug Petcash. Many of you have probably taken CPR classes or basic first aid. St. Alphonsus offers another kind of medical training that could save a life in a way you may not even want to think about. It could stop someone from bleeding to death right in front of you. It's something that could come in handy no matter where you are. The mountains, on a lake, on the roads, even in your house or school or workplace. Joining me now to talk about Stop the Bleed is St. Alphonsus Trauma Nurse and Stop the Bleed instructor, Cheryl Weiss. Cheryl, thank you for being here today. Thank you, sir. Is it that straightforward? What is Stop the Bleed training? Well, Stop the Bleed training is truly just uh, a few simple techniques that you can um, actually uh, implement whether you, you are on the trail or you're in the back country or in your home or in your wood shop, something that you can make a difference before the professionals arrive. Um, often it takes four to five minutes or even longer for a professional EMS unit to get to you. Um, so, and folks can bleed out in that amount of time. They can bleed out in five Absolutely. minutes? Absolutely, five minutes you can bleed out. And if you don't uh, implement uh, some of these techniques that we will teach you in this course, um, well, you can lose a life. And so our goal, our mission at St. Al's Trauma is to get this information out to all the civilians in our community. So obviously it's a local campaign. Is it also a part of a national campaign? Well, actually it is, sir. It's a national campaign. Um, it was first uh, brought to us through American College of Surgeons, which we often fondly refer to them as our trauma docs. So along with their help and our men and women of the military, uh, law enforcement and our EMS providers and the federal government, they were able to collaborate and come together and say, what can we do to make a difference because of so many tragedies that have happened in our country. So when you do these trainings, first of all, who do you do the trainings for? Well, our main goal is to shoot towards our shoot towards our civilians and get them educated and empowered and feel courageous enough to make those first steps when they come across something. That's, that's important. And, um, that, that's what we do. So we're civilians. We're looking for the civilians to through get businesses, schools, businesses, organizations. schools, churches, um, any organization that may benefit. Um, you know, there are law enforcements that are now our men and women are carrying tourniquets with them when they go on duty. So our goal is to reach out to all those folks, our teachers. Mm -hmm. so. so what kind of techniques does this training course cover? Well, it's the ABCs of bleeding, um, just as CPR is airway breathing and circulation and using, utilizing the AED. Um, Stop the Bleed offers the ABCs of bleeding and it's um, alert. We need to immediately call 911 if able. Um, sometimes we're not able to do that. So what we need to do then is look for the bleeding source. Where does that bleeding come from? Identify where it's at and then compress, whether it be with your two hands, your fingers or a tourniquet compress that uh, bleeding mm -hmm. and until uh, professionals arrive. Are these kits that you have here on set, are those available for the public? Would someone who takes the course perhaps get one of those along yes, with it? Yes, they're, they're sold through the American College of Surgeons um, through bleedingcontrol.org. Uh, they're wonderful kits if uh, you want to purchase this type of um, kit and have available. A lot of the schools are doing that. I know our Boise County um, School District is purchasing uh, trauma kits as well. We're trying to get them um, into our local airports, um, our schools, so that when you see these kits and you know that stop the bleed means trauma, that below an AED you will see this stop the bleed kit. And uh, you know, people think of makeshift tourniquets too when they're out, you know, using a belt and a stick or something like that. But these kits have really, looks to they're me specific. like simple ones to use, but. 
Correct. And as a flight nurse for 20 years, I have seen makeshift can, tourniquets. Can you hold that up just to... Um, but with the uh, uh, work from our men and women in the military mm -hmm. who have graciously given us their knowledge and said these are the things that work best, um, they have came up with what's called a combat application tourniquet. We um, often refer to them as the CAT. So um, North American Rescue is the individual that actually makes this CAT tourniquet. Our men, men and women in law enforcement, uh, military, use this specific type of tourniquet. We uh, encourage our civilian population to put these CAT tourniquets, or a soft T tourniquet, into your own survival kit. Mm -hmm. That way you're familiar with how to use them. You can deploy this within 12 seconds on yourself if needed. Um, if not, you're gonna bleed to death and people can become unconscious and it'll be too late. So um, cat tourniquets are what we're advocating for our folks. Well, the way you're talking, I think you're convincing some viewers here to probably look into this. So how would they sign up or get information um, about uh, these Stop, Stop the, the bleed. bleed courses? I, I believe we have an email address that we Great. can put up on the screen for you. There it is. It's uh, B-O-H-S trauma services at sanalfonsis.org. Correct. So what would they need to do once they get uh, to that Once they email? get to that um, email, it'll take you right to our St. Al's website. In the search box, you'll just type in Stop the Bleed. And a couple courses that we offer each month, most often they're on Wednesdays. Um, we do evening courses. We will also do private courses for those um, agencies or companies that have larger groups. Mm -hmm. We're about ready to teach about 100 folks here coming up in December. Um, we're reaching out to our law enforcement. So all you need to do is type in Stop the Bleed in that little search box. You will be directed right to uh, both uh, trauma coordinators and you can register for an event right then. Um, so that's a website, not an email yep. address, right? <laughs> I, yep. I think I said it's, email. Yep. It's a website. Um, and finally, just in the few seconds we have left, do you think that this type of training ranks right up there with knowing CPR? Oh, absolutely, sir. You know, we play hard here in Idaho. And uh, as I mentioned, being a flight nurse, you, we find ourselves in situations that were not expected. And what we do in the very few minutes is the difference between life and death. Right. So this yeah. course is fantastic, and I hope people will reach out and uh, take an opportunity to learn these techniques. Cheryl, thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you, sir. Great we appreciate information. it. Really appreciate your time. Well, as we talked about, medical pros are getting ready for ski season and the traumatic injuries that could come with it. Well, Bogus Basin is getting ready for ski season, too, of course, with the hopes of not a single, even minor injury. But they are working on a huge project to make the downhill experience even better and even earlier for skiers and snowboarders. We'll take you up to Bogus Basin to explain what a big hole is all about up there. Since 1989, the Idaho Lottery has contributed hundreds of millions of dollars that benefit our public schools and buildings, like new pathway lighting for the College of Southern Idaho. To light the way forward. Tuesday, television's number one drama returns. The way that you look at me, wow. This Is Us is back with a new season filled with surprises. I met the girl. You met a girl? No, the girl. Then it's the premiere of New Amsterdam. We are the system, and we need to change. They're not going to let you come in here and just help people. So let's help as many as we can before they figure us out. The premiere of New Amsterdam, after the return of This Is Us, Tuesday on NBC. Her passion to teach Mexican folk dance and culture started as a hobby. We started in my friend's garage, slowly but surely, like it just took on a life of its own. Now it's a booming dance studio. I teach the dances and I share them with my dancers the way they were taught to me. See how this Sevens hero is inspiring a new generation and sharing dance across the Treasure Valley. An all new Sevens hero tonight, News at 10. Ladies and gentlemen, we've all been missing. Zoom dead for five and a half years. It's as if the plane never left the sky. Impossible. I think we've taken impossible off the table. My son has leukemia. You said six months. How am I still alive? Maybe he came back to be saved and I came back to save him. The universe just gave us a do-over. 
Manifest premieres Monday on NBC. Bogus Basin is already prepping for the ski season in a way we've never seen before. The ski area is well into the construction of a water retention pond that will feed a brand new snowmaking system. KTVB's Shira Matsuzawa went to Bogus Basin to get an up close look at the big project. And this is where all that construction is happening. Now, if you look behind me, you can see this will soon be what the embankment of the project will be. And further down where the men are, that's where the pond actually begins. From rocks to dirt to construction crews. It might be hard to believe, but in just about a month or so, this will be a pond used to make snow at Bogus Basin. This is huge for us. Director of Mountain Operations Nate Shake tells us that pond will be 50 feet deep and hold 13 million gallons of water that will run into a snowmaking system. The pond is being built down to capture the runoff from Bogus Creek. Water from the pond will then pump through pipelines and to 24 fan guns. We have about 60 acres that we'll be able to cover with snowmaking from our tube hill, our beginner hill, and a couple top to bottom runs on uh, Deer Point and uh, on Morningstar. Crews began work on the project in June. We are noticing more variable conditions, so later opening seasons, uh, warmer temperatures and uh, you know the snowmaking will provide better coverage in those areas and the man-made snow is denser and will last longer so we'll keep the coverage on the slopes throughout the season versus getting melted off maybe if we have a warm up a warm spell. Don't expect to see any of the installation though. Nate says the pipes will be covered up. Skiers and snowboarders won't really see a lot of the snowmaking they'll just notice uh, that we have more consistent opening dates in the future. Bogus Basin says the system is expected to be fully operational in 2019, but parts of it will be up and running by the time skiers and snowboarders hit the slopes this winter. We'll have the, the pipeline in the ground and the pond will be complete and we'll be working on capturing water, although it'll be slower given that it'll be in the fall and winter that we'll have to capture some water uh, for the pond and not the spring. And crews expect to have the entire pond lined by the end of this month, while the entire project is expected to be completed by Thanksgiving. At Bogus Basin, Sheer Matsuzawa, Idaho's News Channel 7. Bogus Basin says they will ideally open around the first week of December this year. The earliest, though, could be Thanksgiving. And that is all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you tomorrow on today's morning news, and then right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint.